Hi everyone. First day of spring and I was looking at Frank's slide today and there was a blooming flower. So I also feel like we are at the spring of something here today. There is a huge influence of AI and other things to change the way we are doing uh, science and research and education. So really exciting to be here and experience this with all of you. And I've been at SDSC for a while, so I'm not a spring chicken, although I uh, talk about spring. Um, we do some things in AI at SDSC. A lot of our work uh, over the years uh, integrated AI into it, from exploring new architectures to teaching best practices in machine learning and AI to building methods to integrate uh, AI into the society and the applications at that scale. And uh, we are also, as Katie mentioned this morning, um, as a collective included uh, and been in the NAIR pilot activities and discussions around that. And I think uh, these experiences gave all of us, especially me working at the distributed forefront of uh, society in composable systems gave this understanding that there's a huge need for equitable things. So equity is a problem. And I say equitable things because it's not just access. There's like an equity onion. So to say you peel it, more comes out. And when I look at this picture, what speaks out to me about equity versus equality, and I think to all of us, hopefully, is those chairs, you know, you put some chairs and people are able to see the same view. In the cyber infrastructure space and data AI space, um, our thought was what kind of chairs can we put? What are those? And do we know those chairs in the first place? Um, there are a lot of unknown unknowns um, and there are things that we know we don't know. And there are some small things we know that we started using to create some things for access. But even those small things we know went into some uh, reports and approaches. Right? There's a, a great big push for open research, open science, open everything like we've seen today. And there are some reports and studies and legislative approaches to bring inclusion, innovation, competitiveness in an equitable way. And there are also technical approaches to solving equity. So there are actually, we can architect, turns out, for equity, and it can be a technical term itself. And you know, there are open questions to make this vision a reality. Um, at the technical level, can we make even everyone effectively access and utilize data? What are those abstractions, and can we put some foundational research towards those abstractions. And as we do those, can we ensure, ensure um, we can develop the right services and workflows? So we can actually think about user experience instead of building and building, you know, in step-by-step step, those user experiences as we learn things, can we bring in workflows of those communities or those chairs, workflow chairs, service chairs, to people so that actually we can ensure uh, all have access and are able to use. And of course, a big part of this is, while open research is something I personally believe in and push for, we also need to do it right. It's not everything goes. And how do we do it in a way that we protects privacy, civil rights, liberties, and also, um, you know, create an environment that everything from education to AI training to application development has those safeguards built into it as we open up things and, you know, break down walls and silos. And that's my dream. One day we'll actually have all walls broken down. And as I mentioned, we can, I think, architect for equity for those research workflows for everyone to have access to research, resources, and AI, um, and education of cyber infrastructure and in a way that they can utilize data and computing and other things. 
but I think we need to involve diverse users and architect around their access, use, expertise, education gaps. So we need to understand gaps, the gaps. And through those gaps, as we solve those, we need to really change the experience of working with data. Serving data with knowledge is a start. What else can we do? So when communities work with data, they have a meaningful, purposeful experience and they can benefit from it to generate insights to solve their own problems. And this could be at societal scale, education, science, uh, many areas. And that, I think we heard from Katie a great talk to build that community and capacity. What is that ecosystem approach? Through services, platforms, education of many types, uh, what are those building blocks of building that ecosystem? And within that, can we incubate use inspired solutions to scale one day? And while we do that, I think we'll need to explore with new modes of allocation. You know, our tradition is service units. Service also unites, by the way. Um, and uh, credits, tokens, so I have a typo there. Um, aggregated workflow, cooperations even. You know, can we have people solving the same problem have access to some credits and tokens so they can actually get allocated for those tokens or credits to use the service. Education tokens, for instance, could be a concept that we can explore. And then while we do it, what are those modes of sustainable and scalable uh, partnerships? Public-private, NGOs, consortiums, cooperatives, these models exist. And can we find those and innovate around those in our space? So when we started with the National Data Platform, this was in our mind. And we knew building blocks or puzzle pieces existed. But there is this concept from Manish, the missing middle. Um, what is that missing middle? And how can we actually build a middle for AI-enabled, data-driven research and education workflows? So that was our goal. And we created a pilot uh, around this. Thanks to NSF support, we are able to talk about it today. Um, and this is really about the use-inspired approaches to understand a needs assessment study, application code design, and you know, user capacity building through what we learn to build things like services workflows on top of open data, cyber infrastructure systems, and services that already exist out there in stovepipes or silos. So how can we utilize many vertical stacks, so to say, to bring services uh, to communities who can benefit, uh, who can generate benefit from those services. So um, we have a very use-inspired approach here. As I mentioned, identification of gaps at the forefront of it. Um, community advisory boards, maybe external community integration plans, needs assessments, co-design workshops, expansion of prototypes. These are the concepts and technical tools within that identification of gaps we work in. And we would love to connect with uh, any of you, all of you, uh, in these uh, studies. So if you're interested, we are definitely here to hear from you. And after or within that, actually, this is a bi-directional, even the arrows going to the right is wrong in that sense. It needs to be back and forth. And as we learn, can we incubate, innovate, educate? Um, so use our tools in cyber infrastructure, data and knowledge, composable services, composable systems and platforms, and integrate them through these use-inspired workflows and the interfaces for users to use them within an extensible platform. And then from that, of course, sustainable and scalable use, I think we'll have some benefits in this approach that is distributed in nature. Composition is a principle. So if you have things to offer, compose it. NRP actually uh, aligns, it aligns with NRP most like uh, NRP is the bigger umbrella I'm thinking of. Uh, and sustain the backbone and the interface. So it's a lightweight sustainment model and integrate it in education and research systems. And you know that bottom of collaboration, incubation, allocation, partnership models, we need to innovate there. Those models are changing and we need to understand what are those changing models are and how can we collectively build them. So the concept of NDP came from there. 
And, you know, it's a platform. I get asked, what's a hub? What's a platform? Isn't it a hub? There's a hub in it because we need to create a hub for people to collaborate and connect through. This is what I would call the mode of a uh, less experienced user, so to say, or t people who are learning or using others' tools that they were built for them. So discovering and using data and tools and services deployed on cyber infrastructure, it sounds simple, but I don't think we have a capability right now. That's one of those missing gaps that there is no one place an inexperienced user or a student can go to and understand things, find things and use things off the shelf. And as they do that, can we use it as a form of capacity building so they become experts or they start building things that they can offer? Well, that's the platform part of it. So then they can develop and deploy their own services, application workflow, their education challenges. So we create a hub to build capacity for communities to use these platforms to then build solutions and graduate out of uh, this space into their own uh, more expertise-oriented spaces. And I think if we can build it right, it could foster scientific understanding, decision-making, policy formation, because users change in nature. And if anyone can use it, that anyone can use what they learned to generate different insights towards different things. So the objective here in that sense, can we use what exists out there in technology, data, and make those accessible through objectives and contribution of to, to more equitable uh, data and AI research, but also create a broadly accessible data ecosystem that we can put perspectives and diversity in data sources experience of students and researchers. And also bring this concept of, is there a method to madness? Is there a governance that's needed? And can we bring research practices and governance processes um, so that we can actually make sure we can manage benefits and risk at the same time? Being able to do those trade-offs uh, will be very important. So creating those reusable capabilities and amplifying the value of what we have in data repositories to benefit things is the concept. And uh, I know some of you will smile uh, because I love complicated architectures. <laughs> and what's going on here is there's a pink set of things that's data in repositories, in this case, uh, large volumes of data, streaming data, graph data. There's green things that are open cyber infrastructure, the type of things we talked about as well, like NRP, Voyager, Expanse, OSDF, Pelican is that uh, OSDF interface right now. And then there are blue things. Those are the services NRP offers, catalogs, and also as a platform enables. And then there's a concept like that yellow box. That's how can we get data from repositories and transform them into shapes that we can actually make sure they are delivered to the right community in the right shape using OSDF. So that's the concept of this architecture. And you know the smaller boxes you see are capabilities like search, catalog, curation, provenance, but also things like perspectives and access. Who is the user? What are they looking for and capable of? Can we actually understand that? And as we do that, you know, if you go to the National Data Platform website landing page, you'll see that there are some capabilities there. That's a prototype or beta. Uh, we are actually a little bit beyond the prototype that you can use some of these. And you can actually log in using your uh, account. Hopefully at 4.30, some of you will be here uh, to, so that we could show that uh, to you. Um, and log in with your institutional IDs. Uh, we are using Key Cloak because um, we can, through that, work with different identity managers and maybe integrate stovepipes through these role-based uh, allocation usage. <coughs> so, um, and you can access the data catalog to play around with. And data catalog is actually <coughs> federated data from different sources. So NDP doesn't store data. It federates data from other repository facilities. 
And one of the things to do is what does it mean as a life cycle to bring data into NDP, generate things from it, and what happens to that data? Here is something actually we need to understand further. So, so there are things that we are building into it that we are trying to identify. But let's say you found a LIDAR resource here. As you find data, can you subset it, index it, or visualize and work with it, explore with the data before you do other things with it? So we are trying to change a little bit the experience, user experience of finding data and working with that data set. So you can imagine that LIDAR viewer there being actually a stovepipe of other things. Maybe there is a great vertical stack for data visualization. Can we have that run as a service instead of this LIDAR visualizer? So then what you'll also see is a conceptual search. Because metadata, of course, has been an age-old issue, and it exists. But um, can we do other things that integrate AI into actually the way we are ingesting data? So when I have an OSDF origin and I'm ingesting that to NDP, can I use a description of that data to annotate the data with the concepts within scientific ontologies, so some knowledge graphs and ecosystems? So then I can actually, if I was able to do that, and here we see a version of that, I can then find the data and look for what kind of ontology concepts, scientific concepts that data relates to. Here we are seeing lake, I think, is that? but the search was Earth is something. And we are seeing the concept, and by double-clicking on it, we can actually make that query on, um, a lot more specific to which data set relates to that particular concept I'm interested in. So we can actually make the search a lot more detailed through that. We could also do things like when you find the data, then can you link that to a Jupyter service? So the Small, the least you can do with it is to load it into the Jupyter service with the after subsetting and feature uh, analysis of the data in a form. So we can then do some of the analysis and computation on the Jupyter notebook. And once you've done things with it, where does that notebook go? What happens to that service? Is this another you know, thing that we are actually uh, looking to find answers for here, as what would be the best model of that life cycle of that service. And of course, as we do that, we can bring in some performance frameworks. This is MLflow that helps us to benchmark uh, or look for you know, some of the things in the models that are being developed. But one can imagine many different versions of those. And are those services, standard services, that we can link? And you know, what kind of? service links to what kind of performance model comes to mind here. So an example workflow for AI in science or in general AI in research, this is actually a workflow in uh, NDP today with the EarthScope community for earthquakes. And can we acquire the data, in this case data streams, and catalog them in ways that we can now make them relatable through scientific concepts? and also analyze them through notebooks and other things. But as we do that, of course, uh, understand how, for instance, EarthScope community wants to use the data and their collaborators, and how can we make the data more useful and the products of the data come back to the collective. Another workflow I can show is an example, NAIR integration. What we've done was, for instance, go to one of the NAIR resources loaded it into the catalog, ingestion actually through hugging face is possible, and learn from examples that are provided as notebooks and bring those as use resources. And of course, using near allocations through NDP is a thing, natural thing to do next from uh, NDP Hub. And then the platform itself, then once you learn about that resource and how it should be used, building new models and data, generating new data sets, models, insights through it, and publishing it through GitHub, Hugging Face, or other places that the data should go to. And then also using the platform to create narratives or educational resources. So we can actually feed an ecosystem some building blocks as services. Um, actually, this is an air notebook that uh, is also in NDP. If you go there today, you'll see uh, a notebook that shows you uh, the burn scar data from the resource, and it was ingested. Actually, there you'll see two versions of it because this is ingested automatically and also ingested by human 
curation. And actually, human curation still wins uh, from AI curation in this case. That's why uh, the instance that you'll see is that. But I think over time, we can create those curation and ingestion processes that we can take advantage of these things. And in this case, there is also a Hugging Face notebook that's ingested into the platform through it. And uh, you can go and see the notebook and explore with it. But you can learn how burn scar data from NASA was used uh, within a notebook and expand from that using uh, NRP and other resources underneath. And what we are also doing is um, climate-related case studies. Uh, we are funded by the National Discovery Cloud for Climate that was mentioned this morning. And the, these case studies are generalizable workflows for fire, uh, earthquake, and food systems. And those are really uh, meant for replication, as example, that we can work with different communities. And when we started, this beautiful diagram <laughs> was our community expansion model, set of workshops we we're going to have. But what we noticed that all at once over the last six months that we were funded for, all of those communities integrated with us already. So some of those happened. So now we are looking at more collective workshops that we are doing needs assessment and application co-design and expansion protocols. So we'd love to have you all engage in those. And of course, the idea is not to be everything for everyone. What's a capacity building? Um, we took the approach of uh, education and capacity building through challenges. So can we actually work with educators uh, through collaboration with MSCC or AHAC and other consortiums so we can reach out to the educators and have them use NDP to build data challenges for their classrooms in the first place so we can be hopefully useful to them. But once they build it, it could be also tracked as something that's useful to others. So instead of building for the students, building for the educators' capabilities so they can use it as a platform to educate has been our approach. Um, and one thing that we'll show today is a generalizable standard service that we are developing, uh, a large language as a service model. So you know, generative AI, I think we heard this, this has huge potential. Um, and it works, doesn't work. I think a lot of research needs to go into it. Um, and there are libraries, advanced technologies, shortcomings, as we discussed. Um, and it's not domain specific. For science and research and education, if you are going to use it, we need to do better. And I hope uh, Wins will show us how to do better next. Um, so, but we need human curated data and controlled knowledge in them if we are going to use it for research and call it trustworthy, minimum. And it's an equity issue because to be able to use it for research, first of all, LLM deployment is expensive. And today, if we go to open AI use tokens, it's very expensive itself as even if we have those resources, doing it itself, the workflow of doing it and integrating it into your workflow is difficult, especially there's a huge community of social scientists who are not equipped to do it. So um, what we are, and you can do many things actually, uh, but what we are gonna show you a little bit today is if you had a trained model, how do you create a chatbot from it? That could be a service. That it's one small workflow out of what can be done in research using LLMs. Or if you had another trained model and you wanna bring large corpus, how do you create a new model out of it? This doesn't require a huge set of GPUs, but it still, it requires some resources so you can customize it. Of course, you can go from that, from all the continuum of foundational model building and trillion parameters and all of that. But there is an opportunity even with built models to be accessible and serve through services. So commercial LMs, OpenAI has of course some use, uh, but they lack domain specific knowledge and cost a lot. And private LLMs is if you can put all the knowledge you care about and create an LLM, you know all the sources, you can trust that there are good things about it, but required hardware and software is really large. So a community LLM model is, as a community, can we build smaller things that our community trusts and have them customize it? 
So it's sort of the model. They are more domain specific. Uh, climate GPT that we'll show you today is one of those. Uh, but they still need infrastructure to run and to be deployed and to be used. So the LLM as a service in that sense has two modes, that hub mode of can we actually have people use existing models from Hugging Face or the community, community models, and add context with domain-specific documents? That's what we are going to show you today. And the training service um, to fine-tune an existing model to create an EVE model or use a larger corpus, deploy it as a service, these are the platform components. And you know, model selection, enhanced data control, privacy and security, cost efficiency, like lots of things become components to this. So with Nair, I think it brings some capacity to many users with different backgrounds and they can utilize LLMs. And the capability is to train, make use of mixed computational resources, options to select through a range of things. And you know, also I think Nair should have at least one large scale machine learning cluster or machine. Today's LLM we are using model is 7 billion parameter running on NRP. And it's deployed through fast chat um, as a service. At 4.30, we are gonna show you at least a set of steps to log into NRP and use it and customize it with a document. And you now we are gonna make climate GPT understand NAIR context by uploading into it the NAIR task force report. And let's see how it does.